kind of recently, last year or so. Um, so it's a thing layer on top of it, which takes advantage of Scala language features in order to make it a little bit less of a pain to use. Um, but it's, it's kind of, I wanted to contrast here that the difference between crunch and scrunch is not really the same as the difference between cascading and scolding, um, because scolding is really like a whole new DSL built on top of cascading, whereas scrunch is just a really thin layer to take advantage of some Scala language features. So, in scrunch, the whole code, including all the type definitions, is this, um, which I think is a lot more, uh, a lot more concise. So you have all these standard Scala type definitions um, for immutable value classes, and then all these P collections here, and then all your key functions just become lambdas using the underscore notation or using the arrow notation, um, and you save so much, so many characters, and your intent becomes absolutely completely obvious. So I'm a big fan of this. Um, it's Probably not quite mature enough to say, let's do everything in it straight away. Uh, but I have high hopes, because it's quite neat. <laughs> um, so yeah, it fixes all the verbosity and type inference problems of crunch. Get this readable, testable code. Uh, Scala type definitions are, are really easy. I put using Scala can make bad things happen, because Scala has, well, it has a bit of a, a mixed reputation here at Spotify. Um, mostly because it supports every single language feature that anyone's ever invented. And if you just let that loose on everyone to do anything, then you can often generate some really, really odd code. Not quite as odd as people who do Python metaprogramming, but nearly. Um, yeah, and so yeah, and because it's Scala, the IDC support is not quite as good as Crunch. Although like, Eclipse was bad, but IntelliJ did quite well. Not that I'm biased about anything. I don't want to. I don't want to pretend to be a salesperson for IntelliJ or something. Eclipse is good too. <laughs> it's a, I've got. To, I've got to big up the free one. Um, yeah. So uh, I want to kind of make this little aside. I want to make it clear the differences. The main difference between cascading family and the crunch family is whether you're using tuples or real types. Um, and I think you've seen like a lot of the differences in the way that you construct your jobs based on whether you're using these name tuples or real types. So you can you can eliminate a huge category of errors by having your real types present all the way through. Um, and you can still use, if you're using something like crunch, there's no reason that your type that you're working with can be a tuple type. You can You can create your own ordered dictionary of fields if you want to use that as a tuple type. There's no restriction, so you can mix them, but you can only mix them in a statically typed environment. Um, downsides, type definitions can be a headache if you've got a lot of intermediate steps. Um, also, I've, uh, there's a downside here that I haven't mentioned, is that if you want to programmatically construct the nature of your jobs themselves, then having static types is useless. If you want some kind of input logic that's going to determine how to join your two fields together or which two things to join together, then your static types become a lot less useful because you might, you might not be able to express it in a way that uses something that can be compiled statically because the runtime information of the kind of data you want to generate might um, affect it negatively. Um, also, put tuples instead of types can make your pipelines faster because your optimizers can say, I don't need those fields later, I'll chuck them away now. Whereas if you're using real types, you've got a guarantee of having that type available later. Um, and so if you chuck, you can't say chuck away fields because you don't know what a field is. If you're the optimizer, it's just a type. Um, but it can also make it slower because you're checking for things, you're looking up things in dictionaries all the time. Um, if you, in theory, if you had a um, a compiled statically typed thing like a C++ program, um, you could have no overhead for lookups in tuples or whatever. Um, so there's, there's, uh, there's arguments for each. I'm a, I'm a big static typing fan, in case you hadn't noticed by now, but um, the, it's, it's not all good. So quickly, I want to go through two of the ones that are a little bit separate because they're not written inside um, Java and Scala. Um, so there's pig which I'm sure you probably all heard of. It's one of the one of the oldest abstractions over MapReduce, actually. It came out of Yahoo in, I want to say, 
2007, 2008? Maybe a bit earlier. I'm not sure. Anyway, I called it the imperative declarative model because um, it's kind of a mix of writing stuff in an imperative or procedural way and the declarative way of doing things with SQL. If you don't know what it looks like, it looks like a bit like this. Um, this is the same example written out in PIG. Um, some of the kind of nuances about it, I guess, is that your, your loading data is mixed in. Um, it's it's not really conducive to mix to abstracting that kind of stuff away. You'd end up writing a wrapper around it, which is a bit odd. Um, but what you do get is something that is really quite concise compared to all the examples we've seen tonight. This is my, quite possibly the the shortest the shortest script that we've got, the shortest block of code. Um, and this is this is self-contained. This is the whole thing. There's no there's no scaffolding to build around this. This pig this it runs. You get your answer. So it has a lot of benefits in terms of its conciseness. Um, it tends to be better suited to to the I don't know, routine jobs of of joining data sets and filtering data sets and aggregating on things rather than doing kind of crazy machine learning stuff because it's it's got a kind of built-in suite of um, operations. And if you go outside that, then it starts to become a little bit more complex to use. So yeah, concise, high level. The optimizer is much better than almost any other tool that's available. Certainly a lot better than Hive's. Um, Hive is stupid, um, but it's another language you've got to learn. Um, and that's what seems to be the barrier for a lot of people learning it is that it's it's something completely new, and that's that's extra knowledge to keep around. That's extra, yeah. It's just it's just overhead. Um, the data loading is mixed in with the processing. Um, that can offend some people. Um, that also makes testing not so not so trivial um, because you've got to start mocking out data sources and putting files in places and then running the pig over the files in the places or changing the code for the test. So um, either way, you lose. Um, I think there is zero IDE support. Is that right? Uh, there is now a syntax highlighter for Sublime, and that's that's the only one I've seen so far. But no, no real. Don't really get any uh, support from your ID at all, and UDFs um, they're not they're not disastrous, but they're not trivial either. Um, and it means writing stuff in another language or shelling out, piping out to another language and piping back in again, having another process running, that kind of thing. Um, so it becomes a bit awkward. You can do Java ones, but again, you've got to create a Java class and bundle it up, and that kind of thing. So not great. And then Hive, everyone's favorite, sort of. Every, everyone knows what it is at least. Um, so you got your declarative SQL. Everyone knows how this looks, but I thought I'd put it up here for comparison. Exactly the same problem in Hive. Um, I mean, this bit, the actual logic itself, looks really nice. Um, you got your table definitions that you would have to create or maintain. Uh, but uh, the processing itself, you 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 could argue is a is a one of the better of the ones we've seen today. But it has downsides as well. I mean, I've been through the, the familiar SQL-like declarative syntax. It abstracts the tables away from real paths, so um, you can move your data around HDFS as long as you keep your table definitions up to date, then you're safe. Um, it's got built-in support for partitioning where you have you might have a data set available for every single date, but you can just put a date range into your query and it'll know which files to look at, which is a bonus, but none of the others seem to, uh, none of the others provide by their, by their construction. Um, and broken queries won't won't even start up, which is also useful. Um, downside: the optimizer is the worst out of all of them. We we upgraded a job, well, tried to rewrite a job to run in Hive instead of a MapReduce job um, about a month ago here at Spotify, um, and it was one MapReduce cycle in Python. And when we rewrote it as Hive, it um, resolved to five. And that's quite a, quite a lot of overhead just for having a slightly more compact uh, representation. So sometimes you've got to make those kind of trade-offs. Um, testing is very hard, certainly with the way it's, it's built at the moment. You basically have to have a single node Hadoop cluster to connect your Hive to just to run your one test query. And then you've got to save all your, before you do that, you've got to save all your 
data to a file, map the file in a table in a meta store, and so your setups and your teardowns become ridiculous. Um, you've also got extra infrastructure, which is a thing people kind of tend to gloss over with Hive. But you've got to have a meta store available, you've got to have a Hive server available. Depending on how you construct it, it's sometimes the same box and everything like that. But you do need to have the meta store, and that's a database that you have to maintain, and you have to have someone keeping that online. And, and you also have the, the table definitions can go out of date. So it's, it's, it's extra infrastructure to have around. And this last one, the reinventing the wheel, is something I hadn't really thought of until I, we unleashed the power of Hive onto our analysts. And what we noticed was that when people were going to do a query based on joined data or some kind of derived data, instead of creating one data set and then creating another query to work with that data set, they'd put a nested select in based on the one that they, they already knew. So you might have um, 10, different, um, 10 different analytics jobs that rely on the track plane message joined with the user info message. But what happens in the land where people can just copy and paste that fragment as a subselect is that you run that join 10 times. And there's no need to run that join 10 times. So it's not, it's not a fault of the language necessarily, but the, the attitude that it, that it can promote in people tends to lead to that. Right. I think that's all for the mass tirade of, uh, of languages. I'll take some questions, then do a wrap up at the end. If anyone's got questions, one there. I was looking at one thing, Cascalog. Cascalog. Worrying about learning another um, language. Yes, Cascalog is something I did not look at. Um, I don't know much about it. Is it good? <laughs> Does it have types? Okay, I'm not interested then. <laughs> did, did you ignore the first uh, first half an hour? No, it's it's, it's on my to do list, but um, it's kind of my to do list is about the size of my lifetime. So the, the kind of code, so the question was, um, in Spotify, how often do we actually end up reusing code um, for our data pipelines? I think the, the constructions of data, so the, the kind of the mechanical joins and filters and stuff tend to be uh, one-off things. But then we have a lot of kind of UDF type things where there's, there's product mappings to look up, there's um, I don't know, country information to go and fetch from somewhere else, and all those kind of most of them, I'd say, they're kind of micro data sets. So you have um, a mapping from, I don't know, 10, 20, 30 different things to other things. Um, and it turns out that quite a good way of doing that, and how we do that is to wrap those up into libraries and UDFs, because then they're just shipped out to the cluster for each job, or already on the cluster for each job, depending on how you set it up. Um, so. Those are the things we tend to reuse a lot more than the kind of mechanical uh, constructions of the data. You can't pretend there you know go. me. You've got to pretend you don't know me and then ask me a really challenging <laughs> question. Hey, David, who I've never met before. Uh, <laughs> uh, so you, you talked about the optimizer in uh, Pig and Hive. Uh, can you talk about the, if you have any... Uh, uh, what do you think about the optimizers of the Scalding and the Crunch family languages, if you got any feeling for those? Um, well, because of the way they work, they tend not to have optimizers as discrete units. Certainly in cascading, everything is kind of translated uh, literally. Um, so if you go from um, an each pipe to an every pipe, uh, to a group by to an every pipe to an each pipe again, that means you've gone from a map to a reduce to a map again. Um, and I think it will collapse down kind of 
maps next to maps and maps next to reduces as the uh, reduce yeah when you have a reduce and a map it will collapse into the same thing but apart from that it's just the kind of mechanical um keep saying mechanical i don't know why that word keeps coming to my head um <laughs> but it's, it's just that it's, it's the the obvious literal construction of it um crunch i haven't looked into how the optimizer works one because the documentation is terrible and two because i got bored of diving through the source code um I'd be quite interested to run benchmarks of all of these against each other. Um, I think that'd be quite a fun thing to do at some point in the future, just to see, well, these are the, I've gone through the kind of difficulty of, and the, uh, no, okay, um, <laughs> the, the difficulty of programming with them, but it'd be in interesting to see whether the performance implications are, are also um, so, kind of so different, or whether they all resolve to the same stuff underneath. Yeah, I don't have a question. Uh, I have some insight uh, from your last point and the last two beers I just had. Uh, <laughs> uh, oh, hi, David, who I don't really know. Uh, uh, I was thinking about the thing that trying to not let people use, uh, redo the old work over and over. But then if you try to stop that, like from the at very extreme level, you're like making new jobs for stuff that you only one off jobs. And then you have this, I think it was Jeff Atwood, his rule of three or something. Uh, until you see it three times being really useful, then you should probably let them redo everything. So I've been thinking about this awesome regex to find uh, nested uh, subselects. Uh, and we can probably figure out how to like, make that into a compile time error. And, <laughs> and uh, since we have information who wrote the actual jobs, we can, this cannot compile, you should go talk to that person because that's you actually have quite a good idea. Same. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> Just automatically detect, to de detect data sets which are constructed in the same way and forbid them. I mean, the really clever way would be to see that these recurring jobs that are using this data set, that every day this data set gets joined three times and automatically decide in the future you're going to construct that. But that requires a high level, an even higher level of um, knowledge of how your data sets fit together. So that's a, a lot more complex. As you might have heard, we have a microphone. So just put your hand on and I'll run. Sorry, nobody wants to ask him. I don't have to run. <laughs> yes, it oh, makes sorry. it easier for me. Do you think this is specific to Hadoop? HDFS, or if you were going to look at maybe in the future when some of these academic systems or whatever mature, look, moving to Stratosphere or something from Microsoft or Amazon or whatever, would you have to go through all the same problems again, or would these solutions maybe migrate across? Or I, I think the uh, the kind of insight about how and when you would favour types over tuples um, is transferable, and to some extent, the way you just the way you represent data operations in code. I think, personally, I feel the, the, the functional representations tend to look very neat. And I think that kind of attitude is quite fashionable at the moment because you can translate into other stuff quite easily. So I think when these other tools become available, um, I think people might be quicker to jump on the functional bandwagon than they were with MapReduce. I hope so, at least. OK, thanks. More questions? One over there. You and again. Oh, oh, let's do here first. <laughs> let's do not Spotify people. <laughs> Where? Behind you. Ah, sorry. And since you sold uh, all these examples and all of them, all of them had like uh, some pros and cons for a developer starting out uh, and looking to for one of the high level uh, languages like uh, like this uh, that you just presented. Would you recommend some specific ones, or somebody starting out should just know all of them and then just use like uh, what whatever applies better? I I would recommend that you try out multiple. I think uh, depending on your your background and what you've used before, you'll find one or more of them more natural than the others. Um, I certainly wouldn't recommend just doing one and uh, trying one and assuming it's going to be good for you. Um, I think the differences are quite significant, so I, I suggest you just try multiple ones and see which one writes, because this kind of the, uh, the disappointing side of this presentation is that there isn't a right answer. 
you, who I do not know. Yeah. Okay, um, David, have you uh, done any C sharp? I have done some C sharp. Yes, Link. back back in my uh, olden yeah. days. Yeah, three point five dot net, the, yeah. the Link language Be integrator. Before I joined the joined the world of tech, that's actually yeah. uh, so many many years ago. I don't. It feels like eternity. I saw some awesome talk about from some Microsoft guy about Dryad Link. Have you seen that one? Um, I know about Link. I haven't seen the. Uh, yeah. So it's a yeah. Uh, has anyone actually used that for it? Oh, one person, two persons. Is it good? Like, the, if you compare it with the scrunch as a sort of an inferring types and so on, it looked great, but does it actually work? That's sort of, ah, okay. <laughs> I, I can comment a little on that. I saw that demo from Microsoft. They, they've invested quite heavily on in Hadoop, and they have a partnership with Hortonworks, and they built Hadoop for Windows, basically. And their IDE integration, yeah, it sounds weird, but... <laughs> Uh, I was actually surprised when I saw the, the the presentation. It was really awesome. You know, a lot of people probably don't like Microsoft technology here, but um, their in, their integration with with Visual Studio and through Link because they use Link uh, to connect to Hive, for example, which is really really good. Okay. Um, cool. That's uh, Adam, who I uh, also do not know. <laughs> Uh, hi, David. Uh, you talk okay. about uh, Hive Optimizer, uh, yes. which is terrible, but uh, actually Hive was uh, invited by, invented by Facebook to allow their staff to have smooth migration from rational databases to, uh, to Hadoop. So uh, actually I feel that each of those tools were created with different purposes and have different audience like Hive seems to be very good fit for data analysts who, who don't really want to learn some language. Uh, PIG is more ha hacking, a more hacking language. Actually, uh, Scalding, Scrunch is more for developers. So for example, uh, how, how would you, uh, mm, so do you think that Hive, because it's very slow, it's not worth to, optima, uh, to write the code in it because you told that it's in, in, in the example, it's, the optimizer is so slow that it's not reason to, to, to get like more compact representation with Hive. So I think Hive's original intent was to replace the data warehousing software once it got too big, um, too big to store in OLAP cubes and all of that kind of stuff, which was very fashionable about five years ago. Um, so yeah, when that got too big, they built Hive to do this with Hadoop, which was the kind of new thing around. And I think it's still got very valid use cases in that kind of world. If you're doing a, a just kind of let's look at these keys and these keys and these keys and make a, um, some aggregates out of it, um, it's still very useful in that case. But I think in terms of preparing your data, I think it's, it's probably quite quite a lot more useless um, in terms of comparing it to um, the other tools available. So for the analysts who are trying to get aggregates on certain keys, and um, I'm not really sure how to explain this, but there's a, there's a certain, um, yeah, the, the analyst use case, I think, is the, the most useful to, place to have Hive when you've prepared your data sets already and you want to get useful information, aggregates, and um, you know, statistics from those data sets. Um, I think that's the time to, to roll out Hive, um, especially as if you uh, unleash all the all the possibilities of MapReduce on them, then uh, it can cause problems sometimes. <laughs> Anybody from King.com uh, care to comment? Because I know that King.com uses Hive a lot. But in the room. You know. yeah, but I don't okay, you don't want to comment. <laughs> Good. But I know that we have Cool. Okay. Any other questions, comments, abuse? <laughs> Haven't heard that one. I've got nothing thrown at me, so I must be doing all right. Um, Adam. Uh, not you one. again. Uh, is there any language that translates to MapReduce, to run a computation as serious of MapReduce job that you intentionally skipped because you, you had like a limit, limited window of time or you you didn't find it interesting. So is there something that we can also uh, look at? The, 
there is nothing that I thought had a big audience at the moment that, um, like, I tried to pick kind of the top six or the top, I don't know, was it six, one, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, the top four, but then cascading and scolding are kind of related. And so in that sense, I could have probably looked at Cascalog as well, but yeah. Um, so Cascalog is the, the obvious outlier that I haven't looked at, but I do. And there's Scooby as well, but um, that seems to have so much overlap with um, scolding that I thought I think it was scolding that it was, I had a brief look at, and it was it was very similar. So I I kind of discounted it because I thought, well, it's it's very similar. And I was more interested in looking at different kind of models of compute of programming language models and um, systems for constructing them than the actual implementations themselves. Thank you, David. Um, yeah. As you instructed me when you told me how to do speaking <laughs> earlier today. <Yep. laughs> I was supposed to do the wrap-up after that. Um, but you ruined it. But I, I'm going I'm to try and recover it. So yeah, the point was there is no magic bullet. Um, so try it out. Try out different things on real use cases. Don't just use toy examples because that's... Don't do what I did and just use a toy example. Try it out on real stuff because you'll tend to see the quirks a lot better than if you're just trying to do something that you if you say, oh, this is a representative example and it's not a real use case, then you'll probably find stuff in real life that you didn't find in your little toy example. Um, I'd strongly recommend you consider using real types where it's appropriate. Um, that's just kind of propaganda. Um, you might need to support multiple options, so Hive for your analysts and Scrunch for your pipelines and, yeah, something like that. Um, and just kind of think carefully about it because just because you have a history of using one thing doesn't mean it's the best thing, tool for your job. Um, and finally, we're hiring Spotify. You can come and work with people like me and all the people who ask the questions. <laughs> um, yeah, all kinds of Hadoop flavored things we're hiring for. So uh, have a look at that or talk to one of us afterwards if you're interested. That's it. Oh, I'm not sure about yeah, go on then. And um, potentially, I think there's a there's a certain element of that. Nobody's kind of quite agreed on the best way, even to. So, yeah, let me think about this. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think you might be right. Um, there's nobody. Nobody's decided how we should even represent these things and whether we should represent them as and nobody said there's an intermediate step here um, so if you have an intermediate step which is resolvable directly to map reduce jobs in a kind of uniform way then maybe your abstractions on the top of it become a lot simpler or certainly more compatible with each other um, so yeah perhaps <laughs> <laughs>